involved beyond the Upper Delaware. We call it um, uh, the Upper Delaware and beyond. So we're, um, we're we're out there educating people about the history and preserving the historic well, landmarks. The Delaware. Delaware, we call it um, uh, the Upper Delaware and beyond. So we're, um, we're we're out there educating people about the history and preserving the historic well, landmarks. The Delaware. Delaware, we call it um, Mary Page. I'm not sure what you did, but there's a terrible echo now. I'm getting my own voice back. Educating people about okay, the history and second. preserving the one historical second, landmarks sorry. for Delaware. That's a YouTube. We call it um, Mary Page. I'm sorry. not sure what you did, but there's a terrible echo now. Yes, give me one second. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn back. off the I'm gonna mute the uh, YouTube. Okay. Okay, sorry. Yep, you're all set. All right. Okay, so we call it the Upper Delaware Valley and Beyond. We are a uh, a 501c3, so all um, uh, contributions made to our uh, group uh, are tax deductible. And I think you're going to be hearing a lot more about the Delaware company in the very near future. We've been very fortunate. Uh, the can We've signed a contract with the county to operate for Delaware to do programming at the Menacing Battleground uh, this year. And we're very excited about that. We've hired some really good people, some real professional historians, and we uh, expect to continue to to uh, evolve and to do more and more um, events as we move forward. And I think also to broaden what we're doing, I think you'll be hearing a lot about the Delaware company in the near future. Well, now I can't seem to advance my slides here. Uh, this is not going well. Okay. So just quickly, this is a, the makeup of the Delaware company. We have a board of directors, we have an executive director, and we have an advisory board. Um, this will continue to evolve. Obviously, the, uh, the board of directors is elected every three years, the, the terms, uh, so that could change. But uh, we just had elections. Uh, this is a brand new year, so three years uh, for each of these. Uh, just some of our completed projects already. We do the Magical History Tour each year. Uh, hopefully, with the lifting of the COVID restrictions, if things continue to improve, we will try to get a Magical History Tour in this year. Um, we've done the History of Sullivan County six-week courses, which we do each year. We've been doing them twice a year, and again, COVID put a halt to that, but hopefully we can start them up again perhaps this fall. I know many of you have taken uh, some of those six week courses. We do the commemoration of the Battle of Minisink each year. Uh, we do history hikes. Uh, we've done a number of them in various places over the, the last several years. Uh, we've done a few uh, haunted history lantern tours at Fort Delaware. That will become an annual thing. Um, many of you attended last October. We had a great turnout and uh, we will continue to do that. Uh, just some of the other projects there. The Menacing Project, for those of you who are not aware, was a monument that we um, designed and constructed with the help of the county and a lot of fundraising, a lot of grassroots donations from people just like you made the Menacing Project possible. It's a very beautiful monument at the battleground and it includes a plaque that for the first time actually lists the names of, of the uh, the fallen at the Battle of Minnesing, Revolutionary War battle. Uh, we did a historic marker last year for the first suspension bridge over the, the Delaware, which is here in Barryville, where I'm uh, coming to you from tonight. And uh, of course, we're taking over the fort this year uh, for the first time. So we're looking forward to uh, our opening in May. So let's move on and talk a little bit about the Cape Project. The Cape Project is important. Um, I think because the Delaware and Hudson Canal, the DNH Canal is important. And the DNH Canal is important not just to the communities that it ran through, and we'll talk more about that in a moment, but it's important to the entire county. Um, it, its economic impact on the county as a whole, I think is immeasurable. And I think it, it's demonstrative that, uh, that that's the case. And I'll explain a little bit of that as we move forward. 
But one of the first things that we discover is we begin to reconstruct the history of, of Sullivan County. And I don't think we're unique in this regard at all. I think this is probably true about a lot of places uh, <clears throat> in the country. Virtually every historic or economic milestone in our history has come about because of a major breakthrough in transportation. And we can go back to uh, the days before the county was formed in 1764. Daniel Skinner uh, got the idea to raft timber down to Philadelphia. And from modest beginnings, that became our first major industry. We were soon rafting millions of board feet of, uh, of timber down the Delaware River each year. Uh, from 1764, the timber rafting industry lasted well into the 1920s. They were no longer going to Philadelphia, obviously, but they were still rafting timber on the Delaware into the 1920s. So 160 years, thousands of men uh, involved in that operation. And the point is that uh, the Delaware River that for many years was just really an impediment to development. It was kind of in the way. Um, Skinner's uh, innovation of, of cutting timber and lashing them into rafts and literally riding them down river to points like Philadelphia, Trenton, Easton, wherever, um, it turned the Delaware into a major conduit uh, for the transportation of, uh, of goods, in this case, uh, um, timber. Uh, the D&H Canal was a, a, another operation that was very uh, similar. It, it um, made the, the transportation of goods for the first time uh, economical. So goods could come in and out of the county. And because of the DNH Canal, um, the tanning industry, the bluestone industry were able to thrive here in the county. Without the canal, uh, those industries would not have developed the way they did. Sure, the railroad came along later on, but uh, it was. Uh, 20 years before the Erie Railroad came along uh, where uh, moving goods depended entirely on the DNH Canal. We can go down the list, as you can see, um, Newburgh Shecton Turnpike, the Erie Railroad, the uh, O&W, the Monticello and Port Jervis, the Liberty Highway. Each of these had major impacts on the county. Uh, the canal, uh, as I said earlier, impacted the entire county. Uh, in the first 20 years of the canal's operation, the population of Sullivan County more than doubled uh, because again, you could get goods in and out. So people who lived here could, could get uh, goods that made it easier to live here. And people who wanted to work had some sort of industry here, they could ship their goods out. So in the 1830 census, there were about 12,000 people living in Sullivan County, thousand square miles fairly sparsely populated, if you think about it. Uh, by 1850, largely because of the canal, the population of Sullivan County had boomed to over 25,000. So it more than doubled in the first 20 years of the canal's operation. That's how important the DNH Canal was. And again, without the canal, no tanning industry and no um, bluestone industry, many others as well. Uh, the canal in, in its own way also gave rise, I'll talk about this in a minute, uh, to the tourism industry uh, in a very interesting way. Just briefly, for those of you who are not familiar with the canal, it operates uh, roughly 1828 to 1898. Portions of it actually continued to operate beyond 1898, but uh, in terms of uh, the, the length of the canal, 108 miles, uh, you can see there during the first 20 years of the canal's operation, the population of Sullivan County more than doubles and entire communities grew up around the canal. We see this happening a few times in our history. Um, the canal is really the first time that we see canals, uh, we see communities actually growing up around some new feature. It happens again when the tanning industry comes to uh, Sullivan County in the 1830s, we begin to see entire communities grow up around the tanning industry, not necessarily near the canal either. Um, and then again, when the railroad uh, arrives, particularly the O&W, because of the route um, of the O&W or the Midland as it was originally called, 
uh, entire communities like South Fallsburg, Mountaindale, Hurleyville. They didn't exist before the railroad came along. And uh, once the railroad established the stations there, these communities begin to, um, to build and to thrive. But it all starts with the canal. So communities in Sullivan County like Barryville, like uh, Wurtsboro, Phillipsport, Summitville, these would not uh, would likely not exist at all, uh, except for the canal. Perhaps they would exist in a different form than we know them today, and certainly in a different form than they were um, during their heyday. It, it, if you think about these communities, so let's specifically talk about Phillipsport for a moment. If we think about Phillipsport today, now I don't know how many of you on the, the uh, Zoom tonight may live in Phillipsport or how many of you may have for some reason driven through there uh, recently, but very little um, to speak of in Phillipsport today. But at one time, Phillipsport was one of the largest communities in Sullivan County in terms of population. And it had a thriving um, business center there. There was a freight forwarding company started by uh, James Phillips for which the community took its name uh, that uh, thrived because of the canal. And without the canal, Phillips Port, you can tell by the virtue of its very name, uh, would not have existed. Barryville, same way. At one time, Barryville was one of the most important communities in Sullivan County because of the canal. And Barryville owes its very existence to the canal. It was so important, in fact, that in 1844, when the county buildings burned in Monticello in January of 1844, the courthouse and the clerk's office uh, burned. And some of you may know the story. The designation of Monticello as the county seat in Sullivan County was very controversial when it took place in 1809. I won't go into the whole story. But when the county buildings burned in 1844, there was a lot of sentiment on the Board of Supervisors that that whole issue of where the county seat should be um, should be revisited because they had to build new county buildings anyway. So they thought, well, maybe they shouldn't be in Monticello. Maybe we should entertain other possibilities. And Liberty, of course, which felt that they had been unjustly denied the designation as the county seat in the first place, was one of those who put in a proposal. But Barryville was another. Uh, and they were seriously considered as a possibility of the county seat. They offered to put up uh, $3,000 cash and 10 acres of prime land if uh, the county, if the Board of Supervisors would move the county seat uh, to Barryville. It was a thriving community on the DNH at that point, 1844, population about 300. Uh, the timber industry was going full force. So uh, they made a strong case. Obviously, geographically, it wouldn't have been a very wise choice, but that's how important Barryville was. Uh, Wurtsboro, uh, which not only came into existence largely because of the canal, it had there was a community there before called Rome, but it obviously takes its name from the Wurtz brothers, Maurice Wurtz in particular, who uh, built the canal. And, and by the way, I should mention the canal the DNH Canal, one of the very few privately owned uh, canals in America uh, during that time. You know, the Erie Canal obviously predated it, much bigger, uh, more successful, more long, uh, longer lasting. But uh, that was a, built largely with public money. Um, you know, Dewitt Clinton uh, uh, spearheaded that, and uh, by contrast, the DNH was a corporation, private corporation. So a totally different animal and, and really uh, important, not just to the local area, but uh, literally fueled the industrial revolution uh, by uh, bringing anthracite coal to New York City, changed the way the city did business and the way uh, industry was able to operate there. So the canal is important to all of Sullivan County. And that's why the, the Cape project is important. Um, so the canal, really provides the area, Sullivan County in particular, we'll talk about tonight, uh, with the first wave of Irish immigrants. Uh, the canal was built, um, and I know Bill Merchant from the DNH Canal Museum in High Falls and their brand new facility there. They, well, their brand new but old facility, they moved into the 
uh, Dupuy Canal House. That's the new headquarters of the Canal Museum. I know Bill is on tonight. He certainly could speak much more um, eloquently and intelligently about this, but uh, the Irish immigrants who built the canal, um, many of them decided to stay in the area. And so we have two, in, in Sullivan County, we have two waves of Irish immigrants into the county. A small group comes with the construction of the canal, and then a larger group, uh, including, by the way, two of my great-grandfathers, uh, come along when the tanning industry begins to thrive here. And the tanneries are employing hundreds and hundreds of men, and many of them are Irish immigrants, and they bring their families here. Um, both of my great-grandfathers ended up working for W.W. W. Gilman uh, in, in the Gilman Tannery. Uh, one becomes the uh, head bookkeeper there, the head accountant. Uh, they both save up money, buy farms, and, and move on. But And that's kind of the story of the Irish immigrant. Other Irish immigrants who uh, came to the area because of the tanning industry would actually, uh, and probably they were, they were uh, immigrants who didn't have families necessarily, they would actually pick up their roots and move with the tanneries when they moved. It was very common for the tanneries when they would use up the hemlock trees in a particular area. Uh, the tanners found out fairly early on that it was much cheaper to just close down the tannery and move to an area where there were more hemlocks than it was to try to transport the hemlock bark to the tannery. And so a lot of these Irish immigrants continued to move west uh, into Pennsylvania and eventually to the Delaware Water Gap with the tanneries. And we, we have some uh, folks who have traced their, their uh, ancestors that way. So you see a picture here of uh, some of the workers on the canal, hundreds of workers, largely Irish immigrants. Um, many stories attached to that we'll talk about at another time. Um, the canal boats obviously changed in size during the um, life of the canal as it was expanded. They changed tremendously in size. But uh, the reason I wanted to show this slide is it kind of shows, I don't know if you can see in the background there, the, the horses or mules, they look more like mules, I guess that are, are pulling these boats. And the, oftentimes these canal boats were operated by families, but if the canal boat captain didn't have a family, if he didn't have a wife and he didn't have children that he could press into service, he had to hire people. And obviously he was going to hire the cheapest people possible. And I know Bill Merchant, uh, who I mentioned earlier, has done a ton of research into this and continues to research. It's a very difficult topic, but the role of the marginalized workers on the canal. So obviously when you're hiring people for the lowest possible wages, you're, you're going to typically employ what we call marginalized workers. So whether they're immigrants, uh, they're people of color, or they're women or they're children, these are all folks who are willing to work for less than the going rate. And in the case of the hoggies on the canal, oftentimes they were children. Uh, you can see here a picture of a canal boat and the mules and the children. In this particular case, they're riding on the mules. Now it's my understanding that that didn't happen uh, that often. Usually they're walking along with them. Uh, and again, this is a seven to 10 day journey, uh, round trip on the canal. They're moving about three miles an hour, towing those boots, the, uh, those boats, and the the uh, the hoggies had pretty important jobs because not only did they guide the mules or the horses, but they also had to take care of them. So they had to get up early in the morning, uh, get them groomed, get them fed, uh, and then put them uh, away at night. You know, rub them down or or brush them, whatever was to be done. So they had uh, pretty important jobs. Uh, and usually if they were not members of the canal boat captain's family, they weren't treated very well. Uh, we'll get into some stories about that in a bit, but um, there were quite a large number of children on the canal. We don't really have a, a way of compiling numbers. I was chatting with Bill Merchant earlier uh, uh, in the week about this um, in, in trying to put together this this presentation and some other promotions that we're doing for the Cape Project. Um, obviously accounts of, of all of the marginalized workers, whether they be African-Americans or 
women or children are very hard to come by. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a couple of uh, incidents that involve some of these children later on. But these are stories that are really integral to the canal and they need to be told. And so a number of years ago, um, influenced by pictures like this and by uh, E.L. Henry's painting, which we see here, uh, my wife, Deborah, who is the executive director of the Delaware Company, got the idea to um, create a project to tell the stories of the Hoggies on the canal. Uh, she thought the story of these children, many of whom were runaways or, or orphans who were taken out of the, the overcrowded orphanages in the city and brought up here to work, um, that those stories needed to be told. And so largely influenced by this painting by E.L. Henry, which is called On the Towpath, uh, Deborah conceived the idea of the Cape Project. And I was talking with, uh, with Mary Page earlier. She said she'd been um, emailing with Heather Jaxey, who works in the Sullivan County Planning Department. And Heather's our neighbor here in Barryville. And when Debbie was first conceiving this Cape Project, uh, we were somewhere with Heather Jaxey uh, discussing, Debbie was telling her about the project and uh, she was explaining how we were planning to raise money for this and, and so on. And, and uh, Heather said that she'd like, uh, Debbie said, maybe we could get, you know, a, a young girl to pose for the statue that we're going to have done. And, and Heather said, well, maybe my daughter would be a good candidate for that. And her daughter's name was Kate. And so the project became known as the Kate Project. And we thought it was kind of appropriate because many of these children were Irish uh, children who were taken out of the, the orphanages in the city uh, that were, uh, as I said, overflowing with kids. And so Kate seemed like an appropriate name. But we have we have some, whoop, let me back up a little. We have pictures of, of children working on the canal and they would be responsible for feeding the animals as well as leading them. Uh, we don't have a lot of names. Uh, we don't, we have mostly anecdotal stories of, of these kids. Uh, this is a romanticized uh, picture of the canal. This is kind of idyllic looking. You can see the canal boat is on the very far right coming through a little tunnel there. And the, the, uh, uh, the team is pulling the boat and there are some Folks there, probably a little family, maybe a mom and some kids are, are leading the, uh, um, the team of, of horses that are pulling the boat. This is over in Ulster County. It's a uh, very, ro uh, as I said, romanticized version, as I think um, E.L. Henry's painting on the towpath is. Interesting about E.L. Henry, he was one of the founders of the Cragsmore Artist Colony. And he did a number of these paintings of the canal. And usually they were sold, marketed, and are still titled as uh, taking place on the Erie Canal. Obviously, the Erie was much larger, uh, much better known. And so uh, I think the market for his painting probably was broader when they were identified as taking place on the Erie. And yet uh, the subject matter is almost exclusively on the D&H Canal because he lived in Cragsmore. So, uh, this painting here, you'll see a lot of, uh, you probably already have, and you'll see more of it as the Cape Project progresses, because this was uh, in large part uh, the inspiration for the Cape Project. So what exactly is the Cape Project? Some of you may be familiar with the, with the Roebling Bridge, so the, the, uh, or the Delaware Aqueduct, as we like to call it. Uh, the Roebling Bridge, obviously, was uh, part of the d &H Canal. It uh, opened in 1848. It was uh, one of four aqueducts built as part of the canal expansion and designed by John A. Roebling, who uh, later did the Brooklyn Bridge, and that's the source of much of his fame, but has done suspension bridges uh, all over America. And in fact, the Roebling family is still uh, in the engineering business. They still do bridges. Uh, many years ago, when I first became county historian, we had a celebration of one of the uh, anniversaries for the Roebling Bridge. I think it was also a birthday party for John A. Roebling, who, by the way, incidentally, uh, shares a birthday with my wife, Deborah. 
June 12th. Um, John A. Roebling is a little bit older, but uh, we had a celebration which included uh, a cake and, and a little ceremony on the bridge and some of the Roebling family who were still in the engineering business in uh, New Jersey came up for that. I don't remember the exact year, but maybe 99, I'm not sure. At any rate, uh, the Roebling Bridge is there and uh, under the Roebling Bridge, there is actually a part of the towpath that many years ago, 30, 35 years ago, the, the uh, National Park Service actually began to restore. And there is a, a, a hiking trail there now, which will take you to a lock not far from the bridge. So as the Cape project uh, evolved, the idea came about to continue that path along, uh, so it's, it's literally sandwiched in between the Delaware River and Route 97, which obviously did not exist when the canal was built, uh, when the canal was in operation. In fact, much of Route 97 was built on the canal bed uh, so the, the towpath is not intact any longer in most of this route, but there'll be about a one half mile extension that will take the the tow, will take the hiking trail, the towpath, extend it to what already exists, an eagle observation point along the Delaware River. So it'll be about a half a mile of hiking trail extended. And along that route in various locations, there will be some stone benches and some interpretive signs. Uh, this is all part of phase two. So phase one of the Cape project actually took place in uh, 2020. Uh, and the fundraising took place for a couple of years before that. But by 2020, through grassroots fundraising and some grants, uh, we were able to uh, do some selective view shed clearing along the Delaware. We got permission from the state uh, and we, we uh, cleared out some, some uh, brush along this half mile path so that when you're walking along this, this to be created path, you will be able to see the river. Uh, so that was phase one. That was completed in December of 2020. In 2021, largely because of uh, continuing problems with the supply chain and whatnot because of COVID and other bureaucr uh, bureaucratic kind of red tape, um, we kind of got a little bogged down. We were hoping to have phase two completed by the end of 2021. Uh, we're about a year behind now or at least six months. We will not be complete with phase two until sometime late in 2022. But Phase two will be completed this year unless something unforeseen happens. And that will include the actual construction of the trail, an actual hiking trail about a half mile, uh, the placement of some stone benches at various places along. And what we wanna do is set up these contemplative areas along the trail so that people can stop, not that they'll be worn out from the, the walk, it's not that long of a trail, but uh, they can stop, they can contemplate the river. There'll be interpretive signs along the way for them to um, learn the stories that we are talking about today, about the Hoggies and about the canal in general, about the bluestone industry that is really kind of fascinating when you think about it. And all the original bluestone was shipped uh, out on the canal. And uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of how extensive the bluestone industry was here uh, in the upper Delaware and how important it was to the growth of New York City. But much of the construction of, of buildings in New York City during this uh, uh, early 19th century were, were done with bluestone into the middle of the 19th century, uh, were done with bluestone foundations. And then for years after, uh, there were bluestone sidewalks. And then even after they began to use other materials, uh, whether they were cement, which was discovered in conjunction with the canal in Ulster County or granite when they began to bring granite in from the West. They still used um, bluestone for much of the curbing 
because cement was not suitable for curbing because it didn't hold up to the iron wheels. So they would still use bluestone for the curbing. So a lot of bluestone went out of the upper Delaware into New York City. And in the early days, prior to the arrival of the railroad, uh, much of that bluestone, uh, almost all of it was shipped out on the canal. Um, an interesting story, I think one of the largest bluestone uh, magnates in the upper Delaware was a man by the name of John Fletcher Kilgore. And his, his uh, quarries were so important to the economy of the upper Delaware that uh, in 1870, the community of Pond Eddy uh, literally changed the name of their post office. They petitioned the federal govern government and they became known as Kilgore. Uh, they employed so many men and, and the quarries were so important to the area that there was actually a, a community called Kilgore and Pond Eddy, Pennsylvania became Flagstone, Pennsylvania. That didn't last very long because Bluestone is a very risky business, but I wanted to tell you a story about, about John Fletcher Kilgore. So Kilgore becomes one of the wealthiest men uh, in, in the area through the, his Bluestone operation, but he also loses many of his fortunes. Uh, in fact, six times he accumulates more than a million dollars and six times he loses it. He eventually goes crazy. He's, he literally dies in an asylum because he loses his mind because uh, he, he allows these fortunes to, to dissipate. But there's a great story. And these are, this is one of the stories that we want to tell um, on these interpretive signs as part of the Cape Project. Uh, as we said, early, uh, in the early days from 1832 or so, when Bluestone is first quarried in Sullivan County through the end of the 19th century, um, we had dozens of quarries in the upper Delaware. And until the Erie arrives in 1848, 49, uh, that Bluestone is shipped out on the canal. And then once the Erie comes, obviously, uh, the canal and the railroad are competitors for this freight, and the railroad has certain advantages. Um, ob obviously, can operate year round, uh, so a lot of the bluestone begins to be shipped on the Erie Railroad. The Erie eventually is taken over by Jay Gould. Some of you may know Jay Gould uh, as one of the great robber baron barons of the 19th century, uh, largely considered an unscrupulous businessman. Uh, at any rate, Gould is operating the Erie Railroad, and he realizes that Kilgore is shipping a lot of bluestone into New York City and quarrying uh, an awful lot of bluestone. And so Jay Gould arranges a meeting with, with Kilgore, and he tells Kilgore he wants to be his partner in the bluestone business. And Kilgore says, I don't generally have partners. I'm not interested. Thanks anyway. And Gould says, okay, I can understand that, but just so you know, if I'm not your partner, you're not shipping any more bluestone on the Erie Railroad. So now Kilgore is kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, no pun intended. Um, and he has to kind of rethink it. So he goes back to Jay Gould, largely at the prodding of his wife. Uh, and he kind of goes back to him and he says, I've reconsidered and okay, I'll make you a partner. So Jay Gould says, that's great. And there, I have a friend who I want to make a partner also. His name is William Tweed. So he introduces Kilgore to boss Tweed. And most of the construction projects that are controlled by Tammany Hall in New York City for many years thereafter use almost exclusively Kilgore Bluestone, which is shipped exclusively on the Erie Railroad. And Tweed and Gould and Kilgore all make fortunes because of it. I think that given uh, what ends up happening with Tammany Hall and with uh, Gould, that Kilgore probably wishes he had continued to ship on the Erie, on the uh, d &H Canal rather than on the Erie Railroad. But that's just one of the many stories that are connected uh, in one way or another to the d &H Canal. And these are stories that we wanna tell through the Cape Project. So these um, 
interpretive signs, whether there'll be three or four of them, or perhaps more, will be um, located along that half mile extension of the path as well. Um, there will also be a snubbing post. Uh, we're hoping perhaps maybe to have one at each end, but at least one snubbing post. And for those of you who don't know, if we go back to our picture of the canal boats here, you can see that the man who's in the foreground of this picture has a rope in his hand and he's tying off the boat on kind of a very short snubbing post. But th those were, um, were blue stone pillars that were sunk into the ground and were used to tie off the boats, primarily when they were um, placed in the lock, which is how they were able to um, go up and down when, when the uh, topography required that. Um, so a snubbing post is just a stone post. So that'll all be part of phase two, which will be completed this year. We've raised a ton of money to, we have enough to complete phase two. Uh, we've already begun uh, trying to raise money for phase three, which will be by far the most expensive part of this project uh, and, and probably will take at least three years to uh, raise the money to complete phase three, which is to uh, create a bronze statue of, the, of a hoggy, a female hoggy, Kate, and the mule, and that will be placed at some strategic location along the path. Uh, if you've ever been to the Erie Canal Museum uh, in Syracuse, you probably have seen the statue of the, of the little boy hoggy and the mule that stands out in front of that museum. It's a, a bronze sculpture done by a man named Tom Tischler. Tom Tischler, I believe, currently lives in Australia. Uh, but he's agreed to do uh, the uh, statue for the Cape Project. He has sent us a, a few uh, crude mock-ups of what it might look like. We're in the process of tweaking those. Um, but uh, Tom Tischler will likely end up doing the, the, uh, the sculpture for uh, the Cape Project. We're hoping to have that phase three of the project completed uh, in time for the anniversary of the groundbreaking of the canal in 1824. Five, so the 200th anniversary would be in 2025. That sounds like a good time to complete the, um, the phase three of the project. I just wanted to take a moment. Um, I mentioned earlier that there weren't, there weren't many stories that we've been able to chronicle thus far. And as I said, Bill Merchant's done a, a, a great deal of, of the uh, research into this and documented a few stories. But uh, when, when Debbie first started talking about the Cape Project, a couple of years ago, she was contacted by a woman whose, um, I believe, son had done a project for uh, his seventh grade class. And uh, it was about the Hoggies. And she was gracious enough to share the, uh, the report that he did. Truth, Truth Muller is the youngster who did this seventh grade report. But in it, he chronicled a number of stories about um, the Hoggies. Uh, and I just wanted to read a couple of them out of the uh, newspapers. Um, from an 1870 uh, Tri-State Union, which was a, a paper that was published in Port Jervis uh, for a number of years. Uh, this is about, uh, the, head, the headline of the story was A Boy Drowned. And this was about a, a Hoggy named Charles Stir. He was a boat boy, called a boat boy, from Honesdale, Pennsylvania, was drowned early Thursday morning in the canal just below Pond Eddy. The team which the boy was driving became frightened at the ears and jumped off the aqueduct carrying the boy with them. It was with much difficulty that the team, a span of valuable horses, was saved. So this brings out one of the anecdotes that are often told about the Hoggies. Because they were orphans and they were runaways, uh, they were not particularly valued by the canal boat captains. And if they fell in the water, which apparently they often did, uh, the, the priority was to save the horses or the mules first because they were much more valuable to the canal boat captains. 
And a lot of people have scoffed at this and they say, you know, that's anecdotal. But we have this um, this report from uh, the Tri-State Union. Uh, an, another boy who fell in the canal in 1870 was a little bit luckier. From the Port Jervis Evening Gazette, we have this report. Uh, yesterday afternoon, about two o'clock, a team of horses became frightened at ears at Bolton Basin and plunged into the canal, carrying with them a little boy who was riding on one of them. Fortunately, Mr. David Dara was passing by at the time and at once jumped in and succeeded in rescuing the boy and getting the horses safely back upon the towpath. But for this timely assistance, the boy would have been drowned. Um, finally, we have a, another story from the Tri-State Union. Another boat boy aged about 14 years was drowned near this place early Saturday morning. It is supposed that he fell asleep upon the horses and fell into the canal. He belonged to the boat Weeded Logendorf, and his parents reside at Rondout, at which place his body was sent by Wygant and Sharp of your village. Port Jervis. His name was John Angle. And again, that was from 1870, uh, the Tri-State Union. So we do have a few of these uh, reports of, of children. And, and by the way, some of these hoggies were as young as seven or eight years old. Um, 10 was not an unusual age for a hoggy. Um, there are books written about hoggies, largely on the Erie Canal. There are songs about hoggies, um, largely from the Erie Canal. But the stories on virtually every canal uh, in America during that era where the boats were towed by these mules or horses are the same. Many of the hoggies were young children, uh, usually immigrants or runaways or orphans. So uh, the Cape Project will hopefully long last give um, uh, these kids their due. If you'd like to uh, read more about the Cape Project, you can do so on our website. Uh, the DelawareCompany.org. If you'd like to donate to the Cape Project, you can mail a donation the old fashioned way to the Delaware Company, PO Box 88, Barryville, New York, 12719. And we just ask that if you are sending a donation that's earmarked for the Cape Project, that in the memo line of the check, you write Cape Project. You can also now donate online through our website. If you go to the DelawareCompany.org, you can click on the donate button. And again, there's an option there to key um, your donation if you want it to be um, earmarked for the Kate project. So just hit the donate button on the website and uh, you can donate that way. It's a fairly simple process. So that concludes my talk about the Kate project. Uh, as we said at the outset, we'll certainly be happy to um, to answer any questions. And uh, as I mentioned, you can ask me questions about any historical topic, uh, DNH Canal related or not. So Mary Page will, I don't know how you'll tell who wants to ask a question. Are you gonna unmute everyone or how are you doing that? Um, I was, if you wanna use the raise hand chat or I, I, you know, I think everybody would be pretty civil. I think I'll just unmute everybody and let you kind of just, how will I know who to call on? Though? Well, if if you put your hand up or you um, give me a little wave if you're gonna if you have a question, and I'll call on you and then you can talk. Any questions? Or if you put something in the chat, I'll let John know. Oh, I guess I did. I unmute everybody. I think I asked. I unmuted. So either it was a great presentation where there are no questions, or everyone was bored silly. Yes, Laura Klein. We have yes, a question. Hi, hello. I have a question about the the uh, hoggies. Um, did they work through the winter months also? No, no. It was seasonal employment. Uh, some of them would go to school during the winter. Some would try to subsist. They might get jobs doing other things in some of the canal. They weren't sent back. They weren't sent back to the orphanages or the the, the holding places for children i'm not aware of that uh -huh. being done i i don't know for sure i i would say probably in most cases the canal boat captains 
were not going to support them through the winter. So I think mm -hmm. largely they were on their own. Perhaps the, the youngest kids would have been supported, but uh -huh. I think if you were 10 or older, you're probably looking for a job on your own. doing something right. else right. during the winter. It Thanks. was a tough, tough life. And you know what? It wasn't just the kids. Women, in many cases, faced the same thing. Immigrant, you know, whether they were Irish or African-American, you know, free, free Blacks uh, had similar problems. They'd work on the canal, perhaps save a little money, but probably not because they're paid yeah. like $2 a week or something. Yeah, I um, couldn't tell if the little girl in the painting that was taken from a photograph was wearing shoes. Uh, likely, likely she was, but probably pretty worn out shoes. Uh -huh. You know, they're doing, uh, they're doing a, a lot of miles. A lot of walking. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Bill, did you want to comment on that? Yes. Uh, we've this is Bill Merchant from the D&H Canal Museum. Bill, go ahead. We discovered last summer, Cragmore Historical Society got a donation of 150 black and white glass negatives taken by Legrand Botsford. Legrand and his family before him had a, a, a series of taverns at Lake Marizantis up near Cragsmore. Um, I went to the opening because we have three of Legrand's paintings and I wanted to see, and what do I see but a photograph of on the towpath. And I say to, to Bayat, it's so perfect, Bayat Curl, who was the, 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 the curator for the uh, uh, Cragsmore Free Library said, well, I don't know, it says on the slide, canal scene. Well, I happen to have a high quality photograph. That painting was offered to my organization for $250,000 in the 1990s. No, three fifty. dollars $350,000 in the 1990s. That, that's like over a decade of our, our, our budget at that point in time. Um, so I sent it and we put them, I'm looking at it right now. We put them side by side. And it, that painting is, is based on an actual photograph. The girl is absolutely barefoot. It's the yeah. only image that I've seen the little head cover, you know, the little coverings over their faces, but even the steer head on the boat is, is on there. E.L. Henry was an amazing painter because he painted a photograph and it looks just like a photograph. And we were delighted because now this girl is an actual woman. And, and this is a place, there's not many places where there's a, uh, uh, because in this part of Ellenville, the, the DNH canal hugged the Schoengum Ridge. There's very few places where there were buildings on the berm side like there are in the photograph and the painting. But it's really exciting to know that, that, that I, I call this the only contemporary image, you know, during the era of, of a girl hoagie on the DNH canal, even though we knew there were hundreds, if not thousands. So it's a really fascinating kind of story. We'll, we'll probably do a video about it at some point. But uh, well, we you know, know the girl actually existed. and was not just uh, a figment of, of Henry's imagination. And she's barefoot in the photo. Okay, thank so that you. answers your question. That's, that's really where I was getting to, but it was a little Thank you, Bill. Thank you, John. What a wonderful presentation. I, I, you know, anything that the DHTHC or my organization can do to help promote, indeed, I, I have, I just did two presentations on child labor on the DNH, and I have a slide dedicated to you and the K Project, because I think it's a wonderful, wonderful project, and we got to all help one another. Uh, you know, no, none of us nonprofits are, are, are rolling in dough, so... Well, you've been a great collaborator so far, and, and we thank you for your support. And I know Deborah leans on you heavily with your research and your, your resources. You've, you've got a great collection there. And by the way, if you haven't been to the DH Canal Museum in High Falls, are you open in the new place, Bill? We will be open. We, we promised we were going to open spring of 2020. Two, and we are opening the last weekend in spring of 2022. Okay, so so June 18th, we're having a big fundraiser uh, at Mohunk Mountain House, June, uh, June 12th, honoring Bob Anderberg, who people in the in the Hudson Valley know has protected more land uh, uh, than just- Open Space Institute, right? Yes, yeah. And so right. we're, we're going up and, and we will be open, uh, we will be open, uh, uh, barring some sort of COVID related catastrophe, we'll be open June 18th. And okay. hope to see you all there. Any other questions? John, John, there's a question in the chat. Um, I'm not sure if Art Steiner has, can, uh, do you want to unmute Art and ask it directly or I'll just read sure. it? Not, uh, uh, not uh, what time is the hike, jet, John, or talk you mentioned at the Minnesink? Uh, the Minnesink uh, hike, that's a good question. Hold on, I have to look it up. Ah, uh, stumping. Bear with me one second. Got you stumped for once. 
Where is that half mile like that they did? It here. Hold on, hold on. What? Where is that half mile that they did? There's a... It's by the bridge. Where oh, yeah. is what? There was a good road right next to it. Okay, the hike is one second here. I think it's at one o'clock, but let me double check that. Okay. Okay. Now you can Sunday, away. April twenty fourth at two p.m. Two p.m. Good. Thanks, John. That's a diminishing battleground. And we hope to see you all there. It'd be a nice leisurely hike, but I think very educational. Hopefully the weather will be nice. And you may get to meet my new Newfie puppy. I'm not sure if he's going to be up for it, but he won't do the hike, but at least probably make an appearance. <laughs> he's only, he's nine weeks old today. <laughs> Any other questions? It's a big history day, John. The uh, Time and Value Museum has a, talk on the building of the Ashokan the same time, April 24th. It's, oh, is that right? It's history. Well, as I said, I'm at uh, Time in the Valley this coming Sunday. So they do some great programs over there. I'll have to compete with them. We wanted to do it because Celebrate Trails Day, National Celebrate Trails Day is, uh, is the 23rd, that Saturday. And unfortunately, there's a lot going on uh, that Saturday, including here in Barryville, so we made it the following day, Sunday the 24th, 2 p.m. Uh, you know, there's only so many weekends you can do things. So, well, thank you all for your attentiveness. I appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you throughout the spring and summer. We get geared up at Fort Delaware. We'll be doing lots of other things as well. Um, hopefully we'll uh, be graced with your presence at some of our events. So, and thank you, Mary Page, once again. Uh, and by the way, uh, thanks to Connie Keller uh, who is on the board at the library for giving me this opportunity to pitch the project. As I said, it's a little different from most of the presentations I do, but Connie liked the idea of the CAPE project and thought it would be appropriate for me to, to pitch it to everybody uh, through this presentation. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, John. I think it's an important you. project. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you, John. Thanks. Good night, everybody.